Thank you, Jeremy. Had uh, a great Saturday for us. We had uh, 102 recruits here. Um, that all had a great time. When you when you have recruits in, you have a game like that, uh, especially a rival game. It's it's special, and they love it. They they uh, want to come back, want to be a part of it. So it's it's really continues to boost our recruiting because our atmosphere has been so good at home. And uh, really appreciate the, the students um, not only being there, but their enthusiasm. Uh, our fans are making a difference. They're, they're loud throughout the game. They're, uh, they're into the game. They're, they're focused. They're staying. And, and I'm really, really proud of them. And, and, uh, I can't even imagine Saturday night. It's going to be a special, uh, special environment. Uh, Proud of the guys because we the, the plays we didn't make at uh, Virginia Tech we came back and made to win this game, and it's interesting that um, Jovante's fumble when you go back and study it he's, he's a guy that doesn't fumble he had one fumble at, at Wake Forest all year uh, he's trying too hard and he's wanting to win a game so I told the guys yesterday quit trying too hard you're you're good enough to just be you and just play. Um, and, and instead of diving at the goal line and having the ball out, um, we really were trying to kill the clock. We wanted to use their three timeouts. We wanted to score slowly. Um, so, so we didn't need to score so fast. Uh, it would have put us up by 10, but still we're kicking off. So if we could have used the clock and scored, uh, that, that would have basically ended the game. Uh, so he comes to me and wants to apologize to the team. And I said, no, you ain't done for 40 yards or something. He'd be apologizing to the team. What you need to do is hang on the ball. And, and uh, again, don't try too hard. Don't try to do something uh, outside of what you need to do to just win the game. And, and I think it, uh, that game goes back to, in, in our players' minds, the Virginia Tech game last year. We're going in to win it. We fumble. Uh, they're 97 yards away. They take it down the field. The difference is we made a play this time. We didn't make a play last year. So uh, it. it uh, uh, it, it's it's a, it, an exciting time for them, so hopefully that'll be a step forward to them um, just because they, they learned how to win and made the play to win. Uh, Jeremy also found a stat that in our, our seven games that have been so close and come down to the last drive, that's been the closest games in the history of college football since 1936 when the polls were started. Yeah, the most, the most out of eight, I think they've all seen. Okay. So, uh, I guess it's cool. I don't know if it's cool or not. I'd rather it not be that way, but it's, it seems to to be coming down to that um, more than not. Uh, offense really uh, didn't get on track other than running the ball. We, we were inconsistent in our passing game, inconsistent with some uh, protections and had pressure on, on Sam. And, and uh, Phil can talk to you about that some when he gets in here. Uh, but Sam still made the big plays to win the game. We drop a touchdown pass in this corner with Dami. Uh, but Bo Corrales stepped up and made some great plays. And, and uh, Daz Newsom's play up now like I always thought he could. He, he's had two great games, not good games. And that catch he made out here, I don't know how that second on Sports Center's list. Uh, that's a, what a play. Uh, and he's confident. And, he, and he's, uh, he's doing the things he needs to do to help us win. Um, defensively, I thought other than uh, Clemson, well, offensively, we, we really got to handle our ball security. It's the first time we've turned it over three times. And, and we're not good enough to turn the ball over normally and win, so we, we've got to go back. Michael had a fumble early. We got back on. Sam had a fumble on his own read. We got back on, and then we lose a fumble and throw two center interceptions. So that's that's not who we've got to be to win, so we've got to handle the security better. On the other side, I thought our defense played as well as, as they have since, since the Clemson game. Uh, we were tackling. We stopped the run. We put pressure on the quarterback, forced three turnovers, which which is, was the difference in the ball game. Uh, the one thing I would say negative about our defense is when we go up 14 to three, that's the time to go out there and stop them again and, and make them punt. Let's get it up to 21 to three, and, and then that's when you start beating somebody. And that was the worst series that we had all day. They drove right down and scored and scored very quickly. So um, we we still got to learn. We got to learn in moments during the game where it's time for us to step up and, and do things. Um, but uh, uh, the, the last play of the game, uh, you go back to, we kept telling them, you guys have already stopped them on a goal line stand earlier in the game when they were at the six inch line going in. And, um, so uh, we're on the sideline trying to figure out if you need seconds left and no timeouts, what do you do? And I said fade. 
uh, because that's the safest thing, and, and we've had trouble with that play. So I think they're going to take two or three shots up on, on, on our corners. And, and Jay said, no, the, uh, I think the pop pass. I just feel like it's a pass. They can't run it because they run it. And we lay on them, the game could be over. they got to get up, be able to spike it, and then kick field goal to go to overtime. Uh, so we felt like it would be a pass. Uh, felt like the quarterback either moves and throws because he's got time to do that, throws it away, can't get sacked, throw the fade, which is safe. Uh, and, and Jay said the pop pass. I don't know where he came up with it. I don't know why. I never heard that before. And then we've got about four guys that are waiting on it. So, and in fact, uh, uh, Chaz said he, he jumped up and it was so low he thought he was going to miss it. Um, so, uh, great call by Jay Bateman. And, and what a play for our defense to show that they can make plays to win. Uh, down the stretch, and it, it was just a great game. I gotta give Duke credit because when they got the ball to three, they drove it right down the field. And, and uh, we have a fourth down, and we gotta stop. We got a face mask. I mean, we can't help ourselves. And, and then we get the pass interference call in the end zone. Uh, so we had to make a play to stop somewhere in that, unlike Virginia Tech last year that overcame a fourth and 19, I think. Uh, but in this case, our, our defense did that. So that should really help us. Uh, proud of uh, Noah Ruggles. He came back and, and kicked the field goals after having a tough, tough week last week. And he, he seemed very confident he, as he was doing it. Um, we kicked the ball off well after the first couple of times, and, and uh, uh, our punting was pretty good. The Duke punter kept us backed up the whole third and fourth quarter. is uh, is amazing what he did. That, that guy's one of the best I've ever seen. And we're still not doing a good job of returning punts when you a guy's punting at over 50 yards and that high, you should have a return chance. And we're not doing that, so that's that's one of the poor things we did. Kickoff return by Michael Carter again was good. He, that's the second one he's had this year that was really significant and, and helped us. Um, the alternative uniforms, the way I understand the policy is now that uh, the guys get to choose an alternative uniform once at home, once on the road. And they have to use the same combination. So I would think at Pittsburgh they'll, they'll probably wear the navy pants, the white shirt, and the navy helmet. Uh, I don't know. That, that's up to them. The leadership committee decides what they wear. So every week we ask them. They have to stay within the confines of their normal uniform at home and away, except for those two games. And those, those uniforms were ordered last year. So they were already ordered when we got here. Uh, they'll get another alternative uniform for next year. And the kids pick them. So they, they get to pick what they want, so they, they like them. Uh, they also sell those helmets, and already 100 of the 139 have been sold. And it's just Monday, so those helmets are going to go real fast. Uh, this is Military Appreciation Game. Uh, we also uh, have our players and, and staff and coaches dedicate the game to someone in their life that's really important in the military. Uh, so they will, they will call that person and tell them that my week is dedicated to you because of all you've done for our country and, and fighting for our country. We appreciate that very much. Uh, the Bell Tower Walk will be more special. We'll have 50 members of the Army from Fort Bragg and their families that will lead us, uh, lead the team through the Bell Tower Walk. And uh, if you haven't been up there to the Bell Tower Walk, it's been really special. The guys have shown up. And it's it's exciting and, and a, a fun way to, to tell our players how much that uh, they appreciate them. So, Want the fans to all get out early and, and, and be able to, to say thank you to those 50 members and their families of the Army from Fort Bragg. Uh, the uh, honorary corn, coin toss participant will be retired Army Sergeant First Class and Green Beret Brant Ireland. He had seven tours in Afghanistan and lost a leg. Uh, he's a Paralympic athlete, so uh, it, it'll be a, a very emotional crowd too because of what we all think. And, and want to pray for it and appreciate our military. Uh, Virginia, uh, uh, they're one of the more talented teams in our league. Bronco's done a great job. I don't think he's gotten the credit for the recruiting that he's done. Uh, I haven't really studied them, watched them in the last couple of years. So, um, the quarterback's a superstar. I mean, he's, he's made them go. Uh, and, uh, they've lost three games on the road. They've been really powerful at home. So uh, they, they're a defense very much like Duke and Virginia Tech. They're going to be very multiple up front. They're going to move a lot. Uh, they've got two of the best outside linebackers in the country. Um, and, and offensively, they, they, they're throwing the ball better than they have in the past. And they're throwing it quite a bit. So uh, we'll have our hands full, but it'll be a fun challenge for us. And um, uh, again, kind of a rival game between uh, Carolina and Virginia. So it, it'll be fun.
it's, it's fun to be in late October and the game means something. Uh, and and uh, our, our guys will be really excited about that. And I think our fan base is too. Questions? Matt, had you had a chance to check out the Jordan Tucker incident? No, I, I didn't look at it. Uh, I have people that do that for me and look at it. And, uh, you know, somebody got his helmet, they said. He went back down to get his helmet. And then uh, after that, I think he might wave at the crowd or something. I'm used to Texas and OU fighting before the game. And, and then having to separate them, throw flags on everybody. So and on the, uh, at the end of a, a, an emotional game, uh, if somebody says something to somebody, I, I figure, yeah, probably won't happen that way. What, what I'm going to suggest is that we put the bell somewhere that's not near the other team. And we don't need the teams coming together after an emotional game to get that bell. Because that bell is important, so put it in the middle of the field. <laughs> don't put it over there at the entrance. And I think what happened is they're supposed to put it where they think the team's going to win. So Duke thought they were going to win. So whoever's taking it put it over there right in their entrance. And that, that just probably wasn't the, the best. But uh, we move on. I tell our players to always have class. Coach, what's the process for uh, Miles Wolford and Trey Morris to get back? And what goes into that? Can you kind of provide some insight on what's going on there? Yes, we, uh, they've been running. Um, Nick Polino's been running. I don't know where his status is. I think, Ross, the biggest thing will be you'll practice them and you see how, how the, they are they, uh, they're healthy enough to be back out there or they wouldn't let them come. So that, that's been done. The doctors have said they can play. Now the question is uh, how functional will they be and how good will they be? Will they be worried about their ankle or their arm? Or, um, so that, that's what we'll have to see in practice this week going forward. But they, they both practiced, all three of them practiced yesterday. The offensive line didn't do as much. But watching Miles run, Miles was the first one to run over and get the bell. I thought, I said, he looks well to me. Uh, so I told old Miles, I wanted to video that and say, okay, Miles, you, you, you can run to the bell, but you can run to the quarterback. So, uh, but, but that'll be the process this week. We'll practice them and, and just see how they do. We probably won't be able to make a decision until Thursday or Friday because you Will they have soreness? Will they be nervous about planning or, or tackling? And we'll just have to see all that because with uh, Trey Morrison, you can't hit him. Because you got you got to wait till uh, probably game for him to, to have all the contact. So the three being Breeder, Morrison, Wolf, we're going to play this kind of a separate situation. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I haven't been told, but I, I think Polino's again one of those. To, he's inside. Can he plant off his foot? Can he handle all those things? So uh, with uh, with Ruger too, all four of them are are functional, and the, the doctors have said now we can look at them. And the question will be, number one, can they practice all week? Number two, how sore will they get if they get sore? And number three, are they going to be confident enough to, to be able to play and help us? In watching the replay of the game, at the end you were interviewed on the field and you got a little bit emotional again like you did after South Carolina. I get, I get emotional all the time. Well, are you kind of surprised that maybe you got emotional that much? Has it maybe exceeded what you expected as far as how connected you are to these kids and how much it means to you? I, I would think probably yes, but I'm, I'm, I cry for the uh, when we have the, uh, the Star Spangled Banner. I mean, I'm because uh, I, I love the games. I get excited. Um, I love to see the kids having fun. I love to see them come back. I love comebacks more than anything. I hate to get behind, but I love comebacks and. and and to win at the end like that in a rival game where these kids haven't won in this game for a while, um, it, it just kind of gets me. And I, I, um, I need some time. They stick a camera in your face. You know, I didn't. People are talking about the uh, mouthing after the game. I didn't get to see him. You know, I, I saw the young lady that was out there with the camera in my face and the, and the mic. Uh, I don't get to see anything else after after I saw David. So. Um, and I hate that because I like to shake the hands of the, the kids on the other team. And usually I'm good if I have a moment, but when I think about when, when the sideline reporter is asking those questions, I'm thinking about the significance of what these kids are doing and how hard they're fighting and playing. Uh, it gets me. Is it, I, I can't help it. Is it a little different than it was at Texas? Is part of it maybe this point in time in your career, just maybe just you're, you're kind of grabbing onto those moments a little bit tighter than you did before? No, I'm not old. I'm looking at the end here. Well, I, I didn't mean it like that, but... <laughs> I think that at this moment in your career... Well, no, but, but I mean, you, you've kind of brought that up before. You're, you're back here. It's second time here, and yeah. I, it's I, a little uh, different I now. I'm proud of something, Texas. I, I, I do that. We just won all the time. 
<laughs> what I expected. So I had to, uh, when you're winning all the time, you don't cry much because it's kind of what you expect. You cry when you lose. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I think for uh, I sat there and watched the Virginia Tech game last year at the end, even to a point that I was getting ready to text Coach Fedora because I, I like him so much, and I was texting him congratulations, and that ball pops up. And I thought, eh, 97 yards, we're still okay. Uh, and then I have to go back on the set, so thank goodness I didn't send it. And I, I, we kind of can watch while we're sitting there waiting on the set, and they score with 19 seconds left or something. And, and I'm telling you, the, the significance of this was that it's the same thing. Ball pops out, 97 yards away. Um, can you stop them? There's a number of times on fourth down that we could have and didn't. I could not believe we stopped the quarterback counter and we have a face mask. Game's over. So you're talking about emotional. Game's over. Nope. Nah, that's not working. Uh, let's go again. And, and then the fade and the interference and then the first and goal. And, and so, um, and then I'm thinking, uh, we've messed up so many things. Don't, don't take any in the end zone. We'll get a safety and have to punt to, to, for the kickoff. So uh, all that's rushing through your head. But, but what I saw is kids coming off of the, that field thinking Virginia Tech. And I saw kids go out there and make a play to win the game. Hmm. And that's so significant for these kids and the rest of their life and so significant to, to believe and not quit and keep trying for our fan base uh, that it just it's just a, a wonderful message. And, and I think that's what got me. Coach, going back to the uh, confrontations and the controversy that took place after the game, the victory bell and the students and all that and whatnot, uh, going by what you've seen in rivalry games, do you think that emotion and you know, kind of the nastiness that showed itself at the end will, will enhance this rivalry at all and, and, and put it in a position where people are really going to be that much more tuned in? You know, I, people mouth all the time. I was involved in a rivalry with NC State where two coaches tackled each other in the middle of the field after the game. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that one was kind of nasty, I, I thought. And so I came to me, and I'm sitting in the locker room. I'm so happy we won the game. Guy sits next to me and says, hey, uh, one of your coaches just tackled a guy out on the field. I said, what? He said, I was telling you one of your coaches tackled a guy out in the middle of the field. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, one of your coaches <laughs> just tackled. I said, he said, and it's on TV, too, so you'll, you'll get asked about it. So, uh, you know, the people get emotional over these things. It's, uh, that happens, and I think it's a good thing. It's, it, as far as the, the rivalry, it, it helps that we won to make it more of a rivalry because it hadn't been one for a while. They won five out of seven. So give David credit, give Duke credit, and give our kids credit for, for wanting that bell. And, you know, if, you, if, if it's a rivalry and you got a bell, you can't get mad at them for being excited when they get it. So, and uh, I didn't want them painting it after the game because I heard we had some problems with that at one time. So <laughs> I waited till Sunday to paint it. So I tried my best. And, and now I think the thing that will help the best is we should not put emotional kids, one team who had just been devastated by a loss, and one team that was so excited by the win, we shouldn't put them in a corner together with a bell. I mean, that's not smart on our part, in my estimation. So I'm going to find out how we do that, and to me, put it in the end of the field somewhere away from both sidelines. So when some team goes to get it, they're not getting it away from the other team. It's theirs to get. And you can leave it on the sideline of the team that has it till the fourth quarter, take it and put it in a secure place where nobody can mouth to anybody, and, and then we'll be good. Coach, what went, the, what went into the decision to switch from dropping Kim back to Mel Rebels? It's a bad kick, and it didn't look like a confident kick to me. And, and I thought, um, let's try it. Let's go back. It, it change didn't work, and Jonathan, he kicked very well during practice. So when he kicked that one, I thought, well, you know, I, I don't like missing field goals. I think it's if you're if you're going if you're going to kick them, you need to make them. That's what I told him. It's your only job. Do your job. And, and if, if not, we're going to go for fourth downs. I think we're one of the top in the country going for fourth downs and, and making it. And, uh, I told uh, I told receivers if you're not going to catch it, we're not going to throw it to you. I've told quarterbacks if you're not going to complete them, we're not going to pass. I've told uh, kickers if you're not going to make them, we're not going to kick. So make them. And, and, what I have to do is see in practice that they're making them, so I'll have confidence that they're making them in a the game. And uh, you just you have to go with your gut. And when he, he just looked nervous and the kick was off to the right, I said, okay, go back with Noah. Let's try it. Let's see what we're doing. And 
even down here, you, you have to make significant decisions during the game. I think we're fourth and four. There's about probably 240 left in the game, and we're up by three. So in my mind, if we kick the three, uh, obviously we force them to drive the length of the field and score, but they beat us with a touchdown. And if they like to drive the length of the field and kick a field goal, we go into overtime. So in, in my mind, we had to go score a touchdown. Uh, to put the game away because we're, we're leaving ourselves a chance to lose if we don't make, uh, if we just kick a field goal because it's six points instead of seven. So uh, that's why we went for it. And then we were, we were trying to slow the game down and make them use all their timeouts. So when we scored to go up by 10, that they wouldn't have any time left. And, and that's when we fumbled. Do you coach confidence with a kicker different than other position groups? Uh, I probably do. I just tell them I need to make them. I mean, and, and we're very positive. We do it every day. That's, that's the way we start practice every day. We kick from uh, all three spots, left hash, middle, and right, and we kick both guys, and we have crowd noise, and I'm on a speakerphone, and I say on the last kick of each guy, seven, kick to win, six, five, four, three, like a fool, every day, and then we see if we make them. And, and to me, it's like anything else for you. You're going to be winning in golf, you got to putt good. And so kickers have to make them. What did you see from Noah in practice after you gave him the news that uh, Jonathan was going to take over? He had a great week and he was focused. And, and I, I told our team it was a great lesson for all of us that you get benched because you made a mistake at Virginia Tech and you don't pouch, you don't get your head down, you go back to work. And he seemed to have a real good drive and real good focus for the week. And, and then we tested them both in pregame, like we always do. They both did well. They both made all their kicks. And then we, um, after the first kick, I just said that we're not ready for this. Let's, let's go back and do the other. Chris, can you discuss your relationship with Jay and how you two have learned to work together and, and also just the job he's doing a little shorthanded this year? Yes, I, I love Army. Uh, I've been a, a West Point Army fan my whole life. Love those kids and the way they fight, and Navy and Air Force. But Army's been kind of my team of the three. So um, I always wanted to coach an Army. That that was kind of a dream of mine at one point. It just never it never got to that for them and for me. Um, so when I got out of coaching, Jeff Monken asked me to come up and spend three or four days at Army. And I was so honored. I, I, uh, I talked to their staff. I talked to their team. I talked to their high school clinics. I watched them practice, and I was very impressed with Jay. And, and what he was doing, and they were losing. But, but I still thought the guys got energy and knows what he's doing, and, and they're putting a, a defense together. And then I called a couple of their games. I had their San Diego State game two years ago, and they had Penny, the great running back, who was up for the Heisman, and they absolutely shut him down and, and won the game. Uh, and, and then um, uh, the Oklahoma game last year, when they held him to 21, I thought, you know, I've, I've seen his players, you can't do that. Uh, and then to see what we did out here with Clemson when we were a little healthier. Um, so uh, I think Jay is uh, he, he's perfect for us. He's, uh, he's smart, he's tough, uh, he's high energy. Uh, somebody gets hurt, he, he's used to putting somebody else in, so he, he doesn't worry about it. He said, next, if we took um, a nickel who had not played and DeAndre Hollins, and, and we could not lose a corner again and Storm Duck goes down on the first play, and we put a nickel back at corner who has played very little out there. We trained him a little bit last week, and he did a really good job. And most defensive coordinators would freak, and, oh my God, what are we going to do, man? We're going to lose a game. We don't have anybody. And he said, nah, Holland's going right. to leave him out there. I said, okay, that's what we got. But, but uh, that, that's Jay's a, a very confident, very positive person with the players, and, and he also knows everybody recruited. He's, he's recruited this state 15 years, I think, and so he knows all the high school coaches, and that's been a real help for us as well. What have you gotten to know about Jay off the field, away from football? Uh, he's a great father, a great husband, and, and uh, does things right with his family. His family is very important to him. Coach, going back to uh, Virginia, you mentioned that they've been dominant at home, but they've struggled on the road. Uh, Based off what you've seen and what you've learned from this team, why do you think that problem is, and uh, what can you exploit from them when they come to Chapel Hill Saturday night? Well, the, the first thing is they, they lost at Miami in a really close game, and we all know Miami can beat you any week. They just beat Pittsburgh. 
on the road. So, uh, and, and then they lost to Notre Dame, who's really good. And that was a tight game till, till the end. And then this week they lose to Louisville and Scott Satterfield. And those guys are doing a great job. They beat Wake Forest on the road. They, they're running the ball well. They're doing some really good things. So um, I, I, you don't want to go to Louisville right now and play. I mean, that's a, a tough place to play. So uh, the three games they've lost were against teams. They were all close games. And, and they were all against teams that can beat you. I mean, they're really good. Uh, so what we've got to do is, is we've got to start making this environment every week one that is such an advantage for us that it becomes a disadvantage for the opponents. And I think it'll be that way this weekend. And our players have to, to gain confidence about being able to win all the games at home again. And we haven't done that. So uh, hopefully Saturday night will, will help us get it going. But uh, I think they, they start with their, their, uh, their quarterback. That's just a great player. He's, he's turned their whole program, made a difference. And, then what they've done is, is they've done a great job of building the defense. And they're very well coached. There were multiple I coached against Bronco twice at Texas when he was at Brigham Young, and he's a dear friend. And he does a great job with the um, American Football Coaches Association board. He's on that board. Cares a lot about uh, what's right. So um, I, I'm just I'm proud for him and proud of him. And um, He's a dear friend for a long time, and I look forward to seeing him, but I, I don't want him to be happy. Mac, you talked about last week about players wanting to, you know, spend a few extra minutes here and there or whatever. Are they getting that and, and, and the significance of this game coming up here, you know, this, this coastal is still wide open? For yes, I, I told them yesterday that uh, what, whatever you're doing to prepare, you need to do a little more. So if you're spending uh, an hour on video, spend some more. You, you need, if you're a scout teamer, you, you, you need to show us the picture. Go watch Virginia. Go watch the guy you're going to beat and play and try to help us prepare for the game. So I think that's part of our process of learning to win again is especially with our early morning practice. The guys are off the field at 10, and they've got the rest of the day and night with uh, some strength and conditioning classes and some study hall such. Uh, but spend a little time with your coach. It, it has to be voluntary. Uh, but they can come up and, and ask for help, and they can come up and see video. And I, I think that's an area we can do better. I think we can know our opponent better than we're doing right now. We're, we're doing a good job, but I think we can do a better job. Joe Reed is another playmaker, special team, but how my job uh, defending? Do you know, we've done a pretty good job with, with our, our special teams. Um, we, we haven't done a great job with our our field goals because we've had some blocked and we're still working on that. Uh, our punts have been pretty good and, and hopefully Jonathan kicks the kickoffs out, but he's he's really good. You, you cannot get him the ball in space. I'm going to try to phrase this del delicately. Um, uh oh. You, Les you already, Miles. You already and, have. <laughs> <laughs> you and Les Miles and Herm Edwards all kind of you know, coaches in an advanced age. And, uh, <laughs> Y'all won some big games. And advanced age, I like that. Uh, Ross is piggybacking uh, over now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would want to phrase it. Uh, yeah. Herm, I think, has won five games now in the second season. Les has three wins, had a big win this weekend, obviously four wins here and some big wins. What do you think, why is that working for, for y'all, and what do you think goes into success with many have doubted the, the, uh, the moves for y'all? Yeah. Uh, Ross, I, I think the question is energy. There's no doubt that I have a lot of experience. Les has a lot of experience and Herm's got a lot of experience. They even questioned Herm with college experience, but he still knows how to coach. He knows how to communicate and be around people. And, and experience is a valuable thing. You, you even see with me coming back, I wanted Sparky Woods, I wanted Daryl Moody, I wanted Kenny Browning, because I wanted old sets of eyes, uh, advanced age sets of eyes, um, experience, because they can walk around and, and they see things I might miss. And they're not coaching, so they can very well say, you know, um, watch this a little bit. I, I, I think I'm worried about that. Uh, and it, it's, it's valuable for me. Uh, but how can you take Les Miles, who won a national championship, and say, uh, he's not going to make it? The only reason the older guys wouldn't make it is experience. I, I mean, uh, energy. If you don't have energy to do this, is a hard job. These are all hard jobs. You have to, every minute of every day, I left recruits a few minutes ago to come down here. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, you, you have no time off. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're less than I and Herm, and you've been out for a while, and you miss games so much, um, you're going to have the energy. 
or you wouldn't go back. You, 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 you would feel that. Uh, don't, don't turn it over. Got to tuck it away. Uh, but, but I think that's it, Ross. I, I thought about it. I watched the end of Les's game the other night, which was really cool. I hated for the kid at Tech. Um, because he, he was going to win the game, he pitched it back. And, oh my gosh. I thought, that, write that down. For, I showed it to the team. Uh, there was a, a punt that Notre Dame tried to pick up. Michigan got it back on a short field. I showed that to the team. I said, come on, guys. These are, these are, these are heartaches. So let's, let's don't do this stuff. But I, I think that's it. I, I, I think you experience is a valuable thing. Uh, we've seen about everything you can see in this business. So not much gets you up and down anymore. Um, and hopefully we can anticipate the next move and, and be in a good position to try to stop it before it happens. Which is like me trying to figure out that bell. So, so I'll be griping it. Who said what to who next time? We'll, we'll all have it where it's, it's simple and classy. And, uh, but I, I think that that's what it is. Anything else? What led to you uh, getting Kenny Browning here the first time around? Uh, he was the best high school coach in the state. He just won the state championship. He was a Shrine Bowl coach. We lost Dan Brooks to go to Tennessee, and uh, I thought Kenny was perfect for us at that time. He, he was connected to every high school coach in the state. At 72 years old, he, he still is. In fact, it may be 73. Anything else? All right, turn you over to Coach Longo. Thanks, Coach. Thank you, guys.